Showtime. So, all right, so I'm going to make sure I hold everyone's attention here. So, I first of all, want to say um, thanks again for to Dr. Krekka for giving this um, invitation, and it's uh, been very eye opening uh, for me to be here, and actually, I'm very excited for what I've heard. So, um, I, uh, to give you a little bit of my, uh, just to disclose, these are my conflicts of interest in the last 12 months, <clears throat> and um, just in terms of my background, so I live in Chicago. I'm not a Cubs fan. There's been a lot of baseball talk. I'm a Cardinals fan. But I do like, I do like Theo Epstein. I do like them a lot. Um, I married my wife, Kathy. It'll be 22 years since July. Two children, one in college, one a junior. I worked almost 30 years in the pharmaceutical industry, both commercial and uh, research and development. And then I had uh, polycystic kidney disease. I was one of the fortunate less than 3% that had a preemptive transplant. So um, very, very grateful for that. And uh, the presentation, I just like to center it upon my mom, who had dialysis, who only made the 52. Um, my donor, Christine, who donated to me uh, at the Mercy. Could have forget, for, uh, forget her in my life. Uh, my wife was at Prophy, because we were about married for five years when I was diagnosed with PKD. And she really hit the lottery with me, going into renal failure. And uh, also someone, uh, Celeste Castile-Lee, I don't know if anyone here, I know some people here in the audience know her. Um, she was a fierce advocate for um, kidney disease, and she passed away this past year in February. So um, she came into my life a couple years ago and has had a uh, very positive influence and has shaped the trajectory of my to define what a patient voice strategy is. I'm gonna talk about the movement to leading to having a patient voice strategy, and then I'm gonna leave an example of what one would look like. And then uh, second is why a patient voice strategy is important, and then the go through and talk a little bit about developing patient voice strategy. So my talk is gonna be similar to Peter's and also Lewis's. We're gonna to touch upon some similar themes, and I was glad to see that they covered those in their talk. So I'm gonna step back. I'm a big history buff, and uh, last year when I was preparing to give a talk at the American Society of Neurology <laughs> at Kidney Week, um, I talked to Celeste back in the summer to begin to prepare for it, and I went back and I read the book, um, The Institute of Medicine's Crossing Quality Chasms. So I don't know if people here have read it. If you have never read it and you're interested in healthcare, must read. Uh, I would just encourage you to do it. And uh, the purpose of this was convened as a group uh, was to address the fact that the United States were spending such a large percent of our healthcare percentage of GDP, such a large, what is it now, 18, 19%, the fact that we're having outcomes that we're not really commensurate with that investment in healthcare. And based upon that report that was issued, um, there was really six aims they said healthcare should be, right? So safe, effective, patient-centered, I'm gonna define that in the next slide, timely, efficient, and equitable. And then if you look on the right, I wanna make sure I give proper uh, credit to the Institute of Patient Family Center Care. They've also, they actually preceded the Institute of Medicine in 1992. Uh, they've also advanced patient family uh, center of care, and they've also integrated those concepts in all of healthcare. So if anyone's really truly interested in patient center care, uh, I just encourage these, uh, these publications. So what is patient center care, right? How many times do you hear patient center care? So I'm from Missouri, and I'm very skeptical, so you have to show me. And, uh, and I think this definition here is really one that could really, if you take a look at this definition, apply this to delivery of kidney care, I think it, this really kind of, you ask yourself the question, has, has kidney care in the United States, the United States been uh, patient-centric? So it's providing care that is respectful and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values. So in my case, I was fearful of dialysis. I never had to go on dialysis. It was very patient-centered, and I had a great experience in the healthcare system. But the other part is that the patient preferences should guide all clinical decisions. So operating with that principle, and it's an essential foundation of quality of patient safety. I'm just gonna ask you right now as we go along, has the delivery of kidney care in the United States been patient-centered? I just want you to come to your own conclusion on that. So if you look at this, and, and whatever your opinion is on the Affordable Care Act, um, one thing that they did do is that basically the IOM report was a blueprint for PPAC. And if you look at that, one thing that it's, if you look at that passage and the impact it has had upon the patient voice, it has had a profound impact. Uh, it certainly has started to shift from fee-for-service to value-based care, more risk-sharing, and then incumbent upon the risk-sharing is then the need for patient engagement, right? If you're gonna put more risk upon these, these physicians and systems, the patients have to be engaged with their health. Well, the other part, then, too, became a part of the extension of this is the uh, is PCORI. And uh, I don't know if anyone here has done any work with PCORI in the past. Uh, the work in kidney disease research has been limited. I, Mark, I think you guys have. 
your organization. I think you've actually been a great big uh, Deb pilot. Gibson. Deb Gibson. Deb Gibson, Gibson right. So looking at this, so PCORI, um, independent uh, board of governors, 21 members, funding comparative research, and seeking answers to real world questions. And one of the caveat is if you're doing PCORI research, is you have to have patients involved with the research, right? Um, and if you look at a couple of notable research projects that are going on right now, the work with Dr. Bolware and, and Geisinger Health is doing, doing some really interesting work, five-year study looking in, in transplant. And then also the National Kidney Foundation is involved with the study at their spring clinical meeting. I'll be participating in that study as well too. So if you look at this continuation, and then you also have Fidesia, which was, this was I had, um, done in conjunction with the pharmaceutical industry, but if you look at the patient-focused drug development meetings that we have, it was a direct byproduct of the um, uh, of uh, FIDESIA, which goes back to the, the Affordable Care Act. There was 20 meetings in five years. Last September, there was one for transplant recipients. I don't know if anyone here was at that meeting. The audience are patients, FDA staff, and industry. And then the byproduct of the meeting is the publication of what's called the Patient Voice Report, right? So that's that has been a big shift. Um, and then there's another part too, is we talked about devices. So maybe in next year's meeting, we will have representatives. I hope uh, Dr. Greco has. I'm just, taking notes. Taking okay. Notes. <laughs> is, that, is that looking at the other part, looking at the devices, is that just another way with the patient preference initiative is a systematic way to capture the patient voice in the submission of devices that are being submitted to the FDA for approval. And the objective is, is to make sure it captured patient feedback, captured patient input in what's important to patients, and they actually had issued a guidance document last August. So if you look at this, now I'll close with this part and say, what does a patient voice strategy look like? So if you look at a good patient voice strategy, it starts here and it goes all the way here. Now, have I seen that yet? <clears throat> no. The value of it is, is that I think it addresses root causes versus what I think we do a lot of times is chase ourselves around with tactics. So, if you look at a vision, whatever, there are some organizations that are getting closer to this. We'll talk about the rare disease, but there's a lot of work that they're doing there. So my vision is you start here and you're a partner throughout the whole process. Okay, so why is a patient voice um, important? Well, if you look at the argument, just from an economic argument to society, is this patient-centered care? 99 billion spent on CKD, 7.1% of the Medicare budgets on ESRD, five-year life expectancy on dialysis, that has not changed when my mom passed in 86 and when her sister passed in 2013. That has not changed. And if you look at 10 years, I'm very fortunate I'm 11 years and eight months, but still 10 years left of half, half of kidney transplants are still functioning. So I think that the larger issue too is that with, with budgets and things being tight, tight, is that just looking at it strictly from a business standpoint, is this the best use of our resources for society? in terms of those being allocated in other areas. But I think the larger issue is that for anyone who's actually seen a parent or a sister or a loved one go through kidney disease like I saw with my mother, is that the impact it has in terms of disability, the diminished contributions to society, the human suffering, right? When I saw my mom suffer for the, that period of time, it's still indelible in my memory. And I think for many people, the absence of hope that they have in their life. And then I think that we have, there are many individuals in society where they're really not being given a full opportunity to tap into their human potential. So I think that this is part of the message that's not getting out there, right? That the message I've seen many times, there's been acceptance of this. And for this to change, people no longer have to accept this. This is unacceptable. So I think when you, when you look at this too, and I think that you begin to understand this, how this is impacting the larger nephrology community, go back to Dr. Arcuso who was making the comments earlier looking at research funding, is if you look at NIH research funding, this to me is a byproduct of the fact that there has not been a patient strategy, patient voice strategy in kidney disease. If you look at HIV and AIDS, they have much larger NIH funding, but not coincidentally, they also have very strong patient voices in those communities. Conversely, if you look at kidney disease, that voice is suppressed. And I will go back to the ESRD Act of 19, 1972 that was put in law in 1973. I think it's had an impact upon this that was unforeseen. So if you look at this as a community, I think that this is another part, that this is a byproduct of a lack of a strategy. So I do work, uh, I work for a company, uh, one of my clients is in the area of rare disease and, fabric, and it's actually in fabric disease. 
And so if you look at, look at the ways that we can learn from people out there living in rare disease, is that I think part of the reason that the rare disease community succeeded is they focus upon policy first and develop very good policy. And I know the American Society for Nephrology is working upon this, but there was a great investment there too. The other part too is going back to I think the desperation you had with people with HIV, they had to figure out how to work together, right? So the environment for collaborations like this being is occurring is looking at the FDA and the patient community and the industry work in the best interest of patients because they didn't have time, frankly. And that these are all areas that have early patient involvement. And in many cases, the mothers were the ones driving this through the, just their sheer dent of effort. So I think one thing is pretty clear here is they had a very effective patient voice strategy. So if you look at the impact, what does that mean tangibly? So if you look at the FDA approvals in terms of medications in 2015, 21 were orphan medications, 47% of new medication approvals, um, were, those were 47% of new approvals in 2015, and you're seeing this increasing in industry investment in rare diseases, and, and part of it is, is the industry has kind of shifted that way because of reimbursement, but also the rare disease community created an environment so investment was, was very palatable. So I think that you look at that, and it certainly worked. So now we move into the next part and figure that the next part of this is developing a patient voice strategy. And um, so we go back to look at, uh, Lewis, when you were talking about 1972 when it was signed on October 30th of 72, I'll go back to the actual passage of law of July of 1973. So if you look at the context in terms of policy achievement, that was a pretty big policy achievement, right? In a lot of ways. And I think if you go back and look at the role of the patient voice, it had a very critical role, right? People have heard the stories of Shep Glazer, there's a person going onto the floor of Congress and having dialysis. And it actually what spurred me to go back and read this when I visited Dr. Himmelfarb out in, uh, in Seattle and learned about the role of uh, Seattle and the role of dialysis. And looking at, so the patient voice was very critical, but I think that there were some unanticipated consequences of this passage of law, because I think the original intent behind this was that this was gonna be a bridge, not a destination. And unfortunately today, that has become the destination for many people. And so I think if you look at right now, what's occurred in this area is that there's policy and patient voice stagnation. It hasn't evolved. And I'll give you a very clear uh, example. I would encourage you to read up the Dialysis Patients Demonstration Act. And that act is being uh, pushed by a couple of large organizations that will go on name. But if you look at it, I, I vehemently oppose it because it does not help prevent chronic kidney disease, it does not help transplant. So we talk about that happen now, we're now in 2017 and things aren't changing in some respects. I'm just trying to get real right now in terms of what the current reality is. So when you look at this is that I think that going back to the Kidney Health Initiative, I'm not gonna go through this, I think everyone understands what this is, but we saw the articles, right, that drove that American Journal of Kidney Disease showing the lack of innovation in the marketplace in terms of medications. So that was the genesis and Dr. Ron Falk from the University of North Carolina was driving force behind this, so uh, give, give him his proper due. But the patient, so that was formed in 2012. Um, Celeste Castillo-Lee formed the Patient Family Partnership Council, and I get, just like you didn't think about this, is that really what it is, it's an advisory committee, right? We don't, so we don't really provide any type of, um, uh, we provide recommendations, we don't make decisions, but we provide advice to the board of directors. And so what, Celeste's vision was, and I remember she told me this about a year and a half ago, but what she viewed is that the, to solve the issues of kidney disease, those were gonna be solved through the use of patients. Patients had to be part of solving the problems. And so the first step is, is Celeste um, put together the Patient Family Partnership Council. This kind of gives you like an overview in terms of the steps that are done. But what we work upon is that we collaborate upon um, different projects that come to us. We have the ability to, to participate. You know, for example, there was a project that came to me. It was really kind of a end stage role. And I'm like, I have no interest in that. I'm interested in prevention or how do we help organs last longer. Um, the, the board reviews and endorses appropriate projects. It calls work group um, members to post online. And uh, I'll give an example right now, a project that's being worked upon. So, this is essentially what our role is, and I'll share with you some lessons that we, that we learned. We had some, we've had some uh, growing pains along the way, but this is a very positive development due to Celeste. So when we look at the, the next piece of this puzzle, 
and looking at um, who's on the committee. So this is just half of the members of the committee. So Dave White is the chairperson of the Patient Family Partnership Council. I'm the vice chair. Um, Pam Duquette, she's on there. She has a daughter, Lindsay, with FSGS. And then Bobby and, um, um, oh, I forgot her, her name, are also on our committee. So we have about, these are five members, and we were uh, at the um, FDA meeting last September, and we participated in the Oren donation meeting. But I point this out for example that I gave this picture for a couple of different reasons, is that you know when we first started, the people that were on our committee, we all looked alike, right? So when I heard someone here talk, and I think it was you talking about this work with the, the genomics, you know, I think I really would make that call again too to make sure we represent the people that have the disease or do we work there for people that have the higher burden. So I think that was a lesson for us. But one of the frustrating things at this meeting is that when we were there at the meeting, the patients, at least in person, there was very few industry representatives at the meeting, right? So I think going back to if you're gonna have true collaboration, right, you gotta have everybody together. And we'll talk about the reasons why. Um, so one of the things that's very tangible, um, and I'm very much, uh, opposed to patient tokenism, right? And I'll, I'll talk about that. But this is a very good example of a very tangible product, project that's working that's gonna benefit the kidney community. And this is working upon a white paper for overcoming barriers to drug development in children with CKD. So the goal here is to work upon a white paper, diverse work group with different people in the real community, including Pam Duquette, you just saw earlier. Looking at current challenges in the field, looking at insights from each member, lessons have been learned so far, and then putting together a white paper that'll be published to the community that could hopefully help aid development of new medications. So that's some of the work that's being done uh, through the Kidney Health Initiative. So if I if I take a look and say, if you're putting together your advisory you know, committee, some lessons that I've learned is that if you need to have senior leadership uh, support. And so I think that here, going forward, that's one thing we can say unequivocally with the Kidney Health Initiative, that we do have senior, senior leadership support for the Patient Family Partnership Council. Premier Chaudhry has been one of our advocates, he's a staunch advocate, so we have that. Um, and then I think that you look at the people who are on your committee, do they really represent the people who have the disease, right? I mean, do they really represent tangible um, contributions to the committee? Um, I, I think also think about some of the policies and procedures, a lot of times if you wanna to run to solutions, you've gotta invest time in, in developing procedures. And I think the patient voices that you have on there is I think it many times is that fact that it's not just someone who's a patient, but it's also a person who comes with the contents of lots of experiences. Okay. So I think also looking at to make sure that they have their, their constructive and informed. But I think the largest issue too is if you haven't really thought this through with your senior leadership, what your vision is, my suggestion is don't do it. Because I think you can do more harm than good. And um, I just say this, just to help the fish up here, is that um, you know, looking if you're developing your own patient advisory boards for your organizations, I'm sure they have it in FCURE, Dr. Nomofarm is working upon, but what are the expectations of senior leadership, right? So what do they do that this organization is doing within a large organization? It's a valuable source of patient insights. I think the other part too is it adds, is a lot of humility. We've got a lot of smart people in this world, we don't have a lot of wise people in this world, in my opinion. And how do we get wisdom? Is by talking and listening to each other, right? So I think that's the other byproduct of it, because what we've been doing over the last couple of years certainly hasn't moved the needle, although I think we're making great progress right now. And then the other thing too, is I would say too, is that thinking about when you're making that submission to the FDA, I've asked this question to the FDA several times, but I say, how many times do you get a submission for a device or for a medication? How much is the patient voice captured in that? And the answer is very few times. So I, I end with a thought is that are you working upon strategies that are addressing group issues that are gonna make a tangible, tangible change? Or are you focused upon tactics? And with that, that's it. Thank you, and I think we have time for some questions. Hi, uh, Kevin. Um, I'm the other patient advocate in, in the room here. I, um, I'm Kathleen Broderick. Um, uh, I represent uh, my son who has nephrotic syndrome and health with Medicare, um, Kitty International. Thank you so much for the 
for the overview. I just wanted to point out when you're talking about the quarry that um, we are, that's where we're involved. We have a quarry grant to um, start a patient registry, and I'm the committee co chair of that registry. And um, Radco is, is on, on board with me. And uh, we have 700 patients who have uh, voluntarily come on and uh, reported you know, their, their statistics, uh, uploaded their biopsies, if, you know, if they can, and it's, uh, 700 patients across the world. So um, we really, I just want to give a shout out to the Corey Initiative. Thank you, and I also like to say too, I, I made the comment when I was talking to Mark about a year ago about the fact we had a registry, I said the PKD Foundation why doesn't the PKD Foundation have a registry? So good for you. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we were one of the only 18 uh, disease foundations they gave, and the only kidney uh, disease foundation they gave a grant to. So we're, we were very lucky. And, and, and there are also about 20 uh, clinical care networks in that, too. And we can join our data with their data and generate, you know, lots of data about, you know, how people respond to steroids that, you know, aren't, don't even have kidney disease. So. It's a really powerful uh, network, and I encourage everyone to work, you know, looking for it. And to come to Netcare and use our data, it's available. Uh, Good for you. Okay, other questions? Oh, oh just brief. That, that was a great talk. Thank you very Thank much you. for your perspective. So I was just wondering if you could comment on your, your view of how patient advocacy groups can fit into this rubric of um, Yeah, I think it, uh, it all starts with, you know, back to the question is how can patient advocacy organizations, you know, fit in this aspect of patient-centered care. I think it all starts with the leadership, right? It's a, I think they embrace it, um, that it's authentic, but it all starts at the top, and that's where I always look at to see if it's going to walk and walk. So. You said you'd make a statement on tokenism. Can you? Yeah, I just, I, I think that, it, I think just, um, I find it, you know, for example, we want to have a patient at a meeting, right? It's almost kind of like you roll out this little, you know, problem. I, I just don't realize sometimes people understand how insulting that is. Is that, you know, it's like anything, if you if you have a relationship with anyone, it's like if I, um, if I ask someone to do something, right, I've developed a, re a relationship over a period of time, and, and to not have a relationship and then ask someone to do something, would you do that on a context with, so I think that's, you know, and I think that, um, and, I, and I think that just, to me it also kind of connotes also too is that there's a certain arrogance of that. And um, I've had really good doctors, smart doctors, but they never were arrogant. So, I just, I hate arrogance, so. I think we can easily roll this into our next yes, session. Exactly. So thank you to our speaker.